Uh, my name is Yu Kitchen, and uh, this is my colleague, Li Nan Hao. Uh, we are from 316, uh, Qihu 316, and uh, we are very glad to be here. Uh, today we are going to give a topic on the advanced exploration uh, of uh, Internet Explorer. Uh, so uh, this early this year, we attended the Pontoon contest uh, in Vancouver, and uh, we target uh, Internet Explorer 64-bit, and uh, uh, we finally succeed, succeeded in the target. Uh, there are some significant uh, rule changes in this year's IE target. For example, this is the first year that 46-bit uh, a 64-bit Internet Explorer is used as the target. Uh, this means uh, many exploit technicals such as a simple heap spring uh, will not work in 64-bit uh, Internet Explorer. And uh, uh, also, this year's contest enables the enhanced protect mode in Internet Explorer, which means uh, we, after we achieved remote code execution in IE, we still need to bypass the sandbox to uh, win this game. And uh, what's more, uh, in, the, in the previous year, Microsoft has uh, had added many exploit mitigations, such as the isolated heap, the uh, deferred free, and uh, these mitigations uh, are very efficient, and they cured many useful bugs, which uh, can be can be used originally. Uh, so, as we uh, as Open CEO Shao Ki Becker said, uh, this year's Pontoon is a joke. Uh, reduced the price, but the difficult uh, increased uh, very uh, very much. Uh, by the way, this year's uh, price for IE is 65000 and uh, uh, last year is 100000 But this year is much more difficult than last year. Uh, but we do not want to wait for next year, so we decided to take this challenge. And uh, luck, uh, fortunately, we finally succeeded in in the challenge, and uh, so today we are, we want to give some sharing about our the vulnerabilities we used in our exploit, as well as the techniques we used to uh, finally uh, take down the explorer. Uh, uh, so this is our agenda today. Uh, basically, we have two parts. Uh, since we use the two zero-day vulnerabilities in the contest, so we have two parts. Uh, the first part, we will introduce the first zero-day, which is CVE uh, 2015 and uh, 1745. Uh, this is an, an initialized memory bug. We use this bug to achieve remote code execution in the uh, IE sandbox process. And uh, the second part is we will introduce another zero day we used uh, to bypass the enhanced protected mode of in Internet Explorer. And uh, this bug is a risk condition bug. It exists in the uh, IE broker service. Uh, who are we? Uh, we are researchers for our 360 Volcan team. Uh, 360 is a, the largest uh, internet security company in China, and uh, basically we do uh, security researches, including uh, vulnerability research, uh, APT detection, and uh, mm, security software developing. And uh, uh, we have found some uh, vulnerabilities, and also uh, we attended some uh, mitigation bypass uh, reward or pontoon, and uh, we have spoken in several security conferences. Uh, okay, now let's uh, start 
our today's topic. Uh, the first part, we will introduce the initializer memory bug and how we use this to achieve remote code execution. And uh, Li Nan will uh, uh, present this part for you. All right. Hello? Can you hear me? OK. All right. Um, let's start with the first bug, um, which is the uh, unnaturalized memory bug. We use it to achieve RCE, to, uh, to achieve remote code excused. And so what is unnaturalized bug? Um, it is one category of memory corruption bugs. When you write program, when you write program, you will access to the memory, and if your program use local variable, global variable, or dynamic locate buffers, then your program you will accessing to the memory date. So if your program use this memory date, but before it naturalize it you may get the unpredictable result. And we call it unnaturalized memory bug. Here we have two examples. Um, the first one, we allocate, uh, we allocate an int array with 10 elements on the heap. And then we access to the first element of this array, but without naturalize it. So this is a unnaturalized memory bug on the heap. And see the second one, um, we have an int array with, with 10 elements on the stake this time. And still, we access to the first element of this array without initializing it. This time, this is a typical unnaturalized local variable bug. Um, Unnaturalized uh, memory bugs are common in program. You can find many bugs like uh, many bugs of this kind in history. There are many net bugs. As you can see here, MS Chamel, Flash, also in Windows kernel, all have this kind of bugs. Here you can see the right back. Um, if you if you successfully allocate a memory block, you will own this memory block, and if you um, if you access this memory memory block before initialize it, you will get unpredictable result. Then using such an initialized uh, memory state is similar to that you get on the tree and take a seed. Suddenly you find there's a bug there. There's a bug left by the previous passenger maybe, but um, you cannot directly use this bag because it, it's not yours. Doing this will lead to bad result. I mean, maybe it is a boom. <clears throat> and uh, this is our bug. We found it by fussing, and uh, it is caused by C attribute value in C attribute array. This time, the C attribute value is the red bag. Is that the red bag left by the previous passenger? So, what is the C attribute value? Um, you know, the Doom element in HTML can have attributes. You can set attribute to a Doom element using JavaScript like this by calling function get attribute. And the C attribute value um, is an underlying data struct that store an attribute. C attribute array, or say its name in the case, um, is an object that can uh, contain, uh, contain an array of many C attribute values. Um, we need to go a little deeper into the C attribute value and the C attribute array for better understanding the explode process later. 
um, C attribute value consists of some flag fields and uh, value fields. Uh, a C attribute value actually is a variant date type, which means um, it can contain various type of date. Um, the second value in the C attribute value is important because it indicates the type of this attribute. So we call it VT type in red. And if, uh, uh, for example, if the VT type is eight, then this attribute should be a BSTR string attribute. <coughs> let's uh, let's have a, let's look at an example. Here we create a div element and set an attribute to this element. Let's have a look at the memory date of this CDIV element in debugger. First, you can see um, there is a C attribute array stored in the CDIV element. Then we fall into this C attribute array and we can get another pointer, point to an array of many C attribute values. So we dump the first C attribute value. You can see it is here. And it is, it is exactly the attribute we just set to the CDIV element. And the VT type is 8, which means this attribute should be a BSTR attribute. And we see, we see the value type, uh, uh, sorry, we see the value field, it points to a BSTR3. Um, this is the simplified POC of our bug. Uh, we have two elements here. The first one is the eighth element in the document, and the second one is the body element. First, we set uh, some attributes to these two elements. Then, we call the function merge attribute to them. The function merge attributes will merge all the attributes of these two elements to a new created C attribute array. And so, the body element will contain the new created C attribute array after this call. And the bug exists in the implementation of this function. I mean the function merge attribute. As you can see here, um, during the merge, the, the first node in the new created C attribute array is just skipped without being initialized. So, uh, it gave us an unnaturalized C attribute value, which can be accessed in JavaScript. Um, to exploit this bug, we have several steps. First, since we cannot directly use the HIPSPRE in 64-bit Internet Explorer, so we need to leak the address of some object of some interesting object. After the leak, we, we are able to make any kinds of fake attributes. So we can achieve arbitrary read, oh, sorry, we can achieve, achieve arbitrary read by making a fake attribute of uint pointer type. And then we can achieve uh, arbitrary read by making a fake JavaScript interray. Um, with the ability to read and write arbitrary memory, we can set our shell code and bypass CFG, bypass CMET, finally get RCE, get remote code excused. Okay, let's go through each step in detail. Um, first things first. Wow. First things first. Um, you need to be able to control the date in the unnaturalized memory. Because um, this is an unnaturalized memory bug, we cannot set our date after this unnaturalized memory block is allocated. Instead, we should control our date before this object is allocated, which means we should set our date in previous, in previous location.
first we allocate a memory block C B1 and fill it with the content we need. Then we free B1. Um, here although B1 is freed, but the content of B1 still remains because of the implementation. And next, we take our bug, and the unnaturalized memory block say B1, uh, B2 will be allocated. And here we let B2 just uh, be allocated in the memory that freed by B1. This time, when we access to the unnaturalized memory in B2, actually we are accessing to the date left by B1, which is controlled by us. Here are some key points to uh, success, successfully control the unnaturalized memory. First one, um, which is obviously, B1 and B2 should be located in the same heap. And uh, the second one, the content of B1 should not be cleared after B1 is freed. Um, this is dependent on the code implementation. For example, if B1 is freed, by calling function memory protect free, then the content of B1 will be set to zero after B1 is freed, and our control will be full. Last one, um, the content of B2 should not be set to zero when B2 is allocated. This is also dependent on the code impl implementation. For example, if B2 is allocated uh, with C malloc, or using function heap look, and with uh, heap zero memory flag set, then our control will be full. Fortunately, um, our unnaturalized memory bug is controlled because C attributary is located by calling function heap locate, but without this flag set, without the heap zero memory flag set. So we are lucky. So we can control the date in C attribute value. I mean, the unnaturalized C attribute value, we can control it. Um, the next question is, what date should we use to fill in this C attribute value? Our plan is to set the VT type to a pointer type, such as string or object, so we need to set the value field point to a wild memory address. Um, if we are exploiting a 32-bit Internet Explorer, it would, it would be simple, because we could, we could spray a lot of memory block and then let the pointer point into the memory we spread. Like this, like this address. But in 64-bit IE, um, this kind of heap spree will not work, as we said before. Um, in 32-bit process, you may use a heap spree of 200 megabits to control the memory date in a certain, in a certain address. But in your 64-bit process, the memory address space is so large that you have to spray more than 50 gigabits to do this, to do the same things, and I think it is impossible. So, we need an information leak first. Um, if your bug is good enough, then you can directly leak the address of some interesting object, but this kind of bug is real. And if you don't, such, uh, you don't have such a bug, there is another way. You may first um, leak the address of some object in the same heap, and then combat with some kind of heap feng shui. After this, you, you will be able to guess the address of some object you are interested in. 
and this is also what we do to exploit our bug. Uh, we call it relative heap spree. To do the information leak, um, first we allocate some attribute array. And each attribute array contains nine attributes, which is the same with the unnaturalized C attribute array. Um, we set the first attribute um, to a point to a string, which has a 30, 30 bytes in memory. Then we free half of this uh, half of this array, half of this attribute array, and because of the implementation, the content of the freed attribute array will not be cleared, will not be set to zero. Uh, we hope to control the unnaturalized C attribute array with one of this freed attribute array. Next we tackle our bug, and the vulnerable C attribute array will be allocated. If we are lucky, it will uh, use the free memory in step two. And so, uh, and the first attribute, which is unnaturalized one, will be a string attribute. Um, it is also left by the free attribute array in step two. So if we access to this unnaturalized attribute, we will get a string attribute. Of course, we can read out the content of this string. Step four, um, we free this string and, uh, um, and look at a runtime still object. Yeah, this a runtime still object. Um, it is, has the same size with the free string. Now, if we access to this unnaturalized attribute again, it still thinks this attribute is the string attribute. Although this string is, is already freed and be and reused by the runtime still attribute. So if we read out this unnaturalized attribute as the string, actually um, we leave the content of the runtime still object. The first field in the runtime still object is a pointer, point to the runtime uh, runtime still uh, attribute array. That means we can leak the address of this string. Um, this is important. It is really important because we can set any attribute to a runtime still object. Here we set more than 5,000 attributes to it. After this, um, the size of the runtime still attribute array is very large. And then we allocate some JavaScript in the array. This array will be allocated somewhere just after the runtime still attribute array. Um, in previous steps, we already leaked the uh, address of the runtime still attribute array. So, by adding a certain offset to this leaked array, we will get the address of one of these int array. Um, this is our information leak based on the relative heap spree. We have leaked the uh, we have leaked uh, address of an int array now. So we can make any kinds of fake C attribute value. We can make any kinds of fake attributes. Next, um, to, make a, uh, to make a fake C attribute value, we need to tackle our bug again, but a, a, a little different this time. Um, this time, we use a string to control the unnaturalized C attribute value. First, we allocate some strings, of course, uh, with control date. <coughs> then we free them, and because of the implementation we have talked about, uh, talk, talk about it before, um, the free string is freed, 
but the date remains. Next, we take the bark um, and the well, and the vulnerable attribute array will be allocated. Uh, it will use the memory of the free string. So the content of the vulnerable C attribute value will be controlled by the string date. This time, this time um, we set the VT type to VT variant and set the value field um, pointing to the leak JavaScript array. This is a fake variant that in our controlled JavaScript array. We can modify it. We, we, we have fully control of this fake, uh, fake uh, variant date. Um, variant is a date struct that can hold various type of date. So um, you can see some interesting types, such as int pointer, u int pointer, our object. Here we use the uint pointer as our target. Um, we set the type of the fake variant to uint pointer type and set the value field to an, to an address where we want to read. Then um, we read the attribute out in JavaScript. It, uh, Actually, we will read four batches from the pointed address. And this means we can read arbitrary memory now. You can see here is our self defined function. And by calling function uh, get attribute to read out a string. And the call function pass int to change this string to an int type. Um, something more to say. Um, because we are exploiting a 64-bit Internet Explorer, the, the address um, is 8-bit is is length. So here you can see the address low and the address high. Use this function, we can achieve arbitrary read. Uh, oh, sorry, we can achieve arbitrary read. Um, so we get the ability to read arbitrary memory. Next, we want to achieve arbitrary write to continue our exploit. Um, you, usually in IE, we can craft the length field of a JavaScript interray to achieve arbitrary write. But our bug is a little different. In previous steps, we already proved that we have make a fake uint pointer attribute. So why not just make a fake JavaScript int array attribute directly? Um, it is possible for us to make fake variant that contain a JavaScript int array just with a large size. Um, to make this fake JavaScript array, we need to set the variant tab to VT dispatch. So this time, the value field would be an uh, object pointer. We let this pointer um, point into our linked array, so we can fully control the object date. Next, next we create a normal JavaScript int array, and then copy the content from this normal JavaScript array object to our fake JavaScript int array object. After this copy, uh, uh, our fake JavaScript int array object will have the same context with the, uh, with the uh, real object, except that we set the length of this fake array object to a, to a very large size. You can see here, the, the length field is very large. So using this large size array, we can write and read arbitrary memory. Before executing our shell code, we still need to bypass CFG and bypass CMET. Actually, um, this is not a big problem 
if you have the ability to read and write arbitrary memory. Um, here we list uh, some possible way to bypass CFG, and some of them uh, are already fixed, but some of them still not until today. For example, um, you can uh, use the ability of read arbitrary memory to find, find the address of the stick. You find, you find the address, and uh, then um, you can uh, rewrite or overwrite the return address of a function. After overwrite, when the function returns, the code flow will jump into your code. And the CFG checker will not check this value. Another example called Weld API. Um, there are several APIs um, in the CFG write list. And what's more, it have the ability to in indirectly or directly to change the EIP's value. For example, NT continue of the function long jump. So using this kind of function, you can bypass CFG. Okay, after bypass CFG and EMET, um, we are able to excuse arbitrary memory. Oh, sorry, we can uh, uh, excuse arbitrary code now, but you can see um, it still runs in app container. And we have a demo here. Okay, let's uh, have a simple demo here. Uh, is there anyone want to pop up a calculator in uh, IE? <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, we just start in the next explorer and uh, visit our exploit address. Yeah, very quickly. Yeah. And uh, you can see this uh, calculator, uh, which is notable is here. You can see it still runs in app container. So uh, our next task is to bypass the uh, app container sandbox. Uh, okay, uh, enhanced protected mode is introduced in uh, IE 11 uh, in Windows 8.1, and uh, uh, it uses the uh, uh, mechanism called the uh, APP container to further restrict the rights of uh, the sandboxed processes. Uh, it restricts their access to system resources. Uh, Basically, the processes uh, running on the APP container will have very limited access to system and resources. For example, uh, an IE sandbox process even has no rights to access the low integrity temp folder. Uh, uh, so uh, we use a bug. Uh, Called CV uh, 2015 and uh, 1743. Uh, this is a TOC TOU bug, or sometimes known as a risk condition bug. It is a logical bug instead of memory corruption bug. 
Uh, this bug is, exists in the IE install broker service. So uh, le let's introduce the broker service in Windows 8. Uh, as we introduced previously, uh, the APP container process have very limited access to system resources. Uh, but sometimes this process need to uh, access certain resources to provide their normal functionality. For example, uh, IE may need to install some uh, plugins, and uh, a flash uh, a flash plugin may need to access a, a flash a folder to access their cache data, such as uh, this. So there are some uh, processes in the system running in medium integrity level. And this process provides the, uh, the functionality to the APP container processes to help, the, uh, to help them to uh, access system resources. And uh, uh, IE AX install broker is one of these broker services. It is used by uh, Internet Explorer to install add-ons uh, or <coughs> plugins. Uh, the process which provides this interface called IE install.exe and it is running in media integrity level. This interface is accessible from uh, within a uh, APP container process, uh, which means if we achieve the remote code execution in APP container process, uh, we can just write code to access this interface. And we can use this interface to install plugins. Mm, basically, to use this interface to install, an, uh, for example, an executable file, we need three steps. Uh, called verify file, install file, and uh, register exe file. Uh, we first uh, ex uh, achieve, uh, re acquire a interface to this broker, and we just call these three functions one by one. And uh, if either of these functions fails, the installation will be failed. Uh, so let's have a look at what exactly these three steps do. Uh, first, first step is called the verify file. Uh, this is the most important step from the uh, perspective of security. Uh, it will try to verify that whether the file you want to install, you are trying to install, has valid signature. Your file must have a valid signature. Otherwise, the verify file step will be failed. And it also checks that the file you are trying to install is from a folder that, uh, which is not low integrity level. You, you, uh, you will at least have uh, this file on the medium integrity level folder. Otherwise, it will also fail. And uh, the second step called install file, it is just simply, uh, simply copy the file to our destination folder where you want to install this file. And uh, the third step, which is also important, it will just call create process to execute the file you want to install. Uh, it seems okay because uh, this interface will first try to valid, ver verify that uh, the file you want to install has valid signatures. But if you uh, review the, uh, the three steps again, you may find there is a risk condition problem here, uh, which exists between step one and step three. Uh, because this file is verified in step one, and uh, executed in step three. But before uh, it executes this file in step three, it does not verify this file again. Which means if you are able to replace this file between the step one and the step three, then it will, uh, the install broker will not know that the file is not the one that verified in the first step. Uh, and this is a bug. Uh, to exploit this bug, it is very straightforward. First, we call verify file to verify an 
valid file, which has valid signature. For example, we just verify the uh, Internet Explorer, Explorer executable. And uh, of course, this, this uh, step can be parsed because the, this file has a valid signature uh, from Microsoft. And uh, second, we call install file, and uh, the iExplore executable will be copied to our destination folder. And uh, here is the most important step. Before we call the third step, we just delete this, uh, the Internet Explorer file and replace it with our own executable file. Uh, you can see we just replaced a, a calculator named iExplorer.exe here. And then we call the third step register.exe file. And, uh, sorry. Uh, and this file will, uh, our, our payload will be cr uh, executed by the broker service, which means uh, our payload can run in media integrity level and we bypass the enhanced pro protect mode sandbox. Uh, here's another problem here in order to use this exploit process. Uh, since we need to be able to replace the file in the destination folder, it means we must have right access to this de uh, destination folder. So we must find a folder which we can write within the app container process. And uh, basically, this is uh, there's not many such folders since app containers has very limited access to system folders. Uh, so here, uh, another broker service helped, uh, helped us, which is a Flash broker. Uh, Flash broker is used by Flash plugins, and it provided some uh, interfaces to the Flash plugin to uh, read and write some system folders. Uh, you can use this broker to read and write some predefined locations in the system, uh, such as this one, uh, the app data roaming Adobe, flat, Adobe folder under the user folder. And you can use the broker to write into this folder, and uh, which is important, this folder is, is not low integrity. So this is uh, exactly the one we want to find. Uh, another little problem here is Flash Broker try to uh, try to prevent you from writing the dangerous file, for example, executable files, to to its uh, folder. So there is a white list that of the file extensions that you can write to use this broker, and. Uh, EXE file is not in this white list. But uh, that's not a big problem because the uh, create process API will just uh, will check the, the, the actual file type. So even you you uh, name your file as 1.jpg and call pre create process on it, it can still execute it as a valid PE file. Yeah. So, so this white list is just useless. Uh, okay. Uh, there's a the last defense line of flash broker to try to prevent you from uh, writing PE files to the folder. Uh, it's where when you call the broker function called the broker write file to write a data to the file, it will try to check that whether you are writing a PE file by uh, by searching the PE signature, uh, for example, the DOS head and the PE head here, and if it finds such signature, it will consider that you are trying to write a dangerous file and the write uh, will be failed. Uh, but this check is not not uh, uh, is not uh, very useful since it only checks the first time that you are trying to write to the file. So we can just bypass this check like this. First, we write the p uh, write the file data without the dot signature. We just put a zero in in the location, and then we can call uh, another function called 
broker set fire pointer, which is uh, which is the same as the set fire pointer function in Windows API. So we can set the fire pointer back to the beginning of the fire, and this time we just uh, write the DOS header, just write the two bytes DOS signature, and then we have a completed P fire and bypasses its defense. So we have another demo here. So uh, first we start in Internet Explorer, and you can see what? You can see uh, the child process runs in app container, and now. Uh, The PID of this process is a two nine four four. So we just inject our DL to bypass the uh, EPM. Uh, to to uh, to get to uh, see the steps clearly, we have some message box in the uh, in the DR. and you can see before we call install fire, we can check the flash folder. Uh, you can see there are no extra files in here, and uh, we will call install fire to install the iExplorer executable first. And you can see it is installed. Here we have a file named test.testbin.temp. And uh, actually, it is Internet Explorer pro, uh, executable. And it has a valid Microsoft signature, which uh, helps us to bypass the first check. And then we will overwrite this executable with our own payload. And you can see, after we overwrite this file, the file size becomes small. And actually, it is now our payload executable. And then we just call the last step. And you can see, uh, our executable is uh, executed by the iInstall broker service here. Uh, this test will I'm being and uh, you can see this process already runs in media integrity level, which means we have bypassed the EPM of Internet Explorer, and uh, that's. And this time we have fully uh, succeeded, succeeded in this target. Uh, we want to thank uh, Black Hat Committee to have us here, and thanks to Zero Day Initiative to, uh, to have the Pontoon contest. And also we want to thank the guys in 360 World Can team and we for working this uh, exploit together. And uh, uh, so uh, this is uh, the key point of our uh, 
our talk today, and uh, we we introduce uh, some uh, some technicals to exploit the latest Internet Explorer 11 for the uh, 64 bits, and uh, uh, we introduce uh, uh, some method to exploit uninitialized memory bugs. And we also introduce this uh, how to bypass the EPM sandbox of Internet Explorer. Uh, okay, that's all for our talk today. Thank you for coming, and if you have any questions, uh, we will be glad to answer you. Thank you.